Okay, one of the highlights. One of the highlights of the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival coming up in July is a film called Speed is Expensive, Philip Vincent and the Million Dollar Motorcycle. And I must say I learned a lot about motorcycles from this documentary. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the writer-director of the documentary, David Lancaster, all the way from the UK. David, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thank you very much for having me on. Good to talk to you, and this is such a <laughs> this is uh, such a fascinating documentary about someone I really didn't know anything about, uh, not being a, a rev head or motorcycle fan. But uh, as I said, I learned so much. Mm. Uh, tell me what uh, prompted you to make this film. Um, well, several reasons. Uh, I've I've always been a an enthusiast for the Vincent motorcycle. My father had one. And I hooked up with my co-producer, Jerry Jenkinson. And we were chatting and Jerry's, uh, I'm going to cough, I'm apologizing, sorry. Uh, excuse me. Um, if you can edit that out or we can go from the top. Keep going. Uh, yeah, Jerry and I uh, got together at a Vincent owners meeting and wondered how many people were left who built the motorcycles, excuse me, <laughs> oh, terribly sorry, hold on, <laughs> that's all right, choice. okay, mm. that's all right, we'll just keep going, okay, um, yes, the, the, the project began uh, when I got chatting to my co-producer, Jerry Jenkinson, uh, at a Vincent owners meeting and we we began to wonder how many of the original factory personnel were still around um jerry and i loved vincent's all our lives jerry is a former lighting director at the national theater and very technical and my background is in journalism so we began tracking these ladies and gentlemen down and it sort of mushroomed from there i i knew there was a great story about Vincent, because he was from a wealthy family, um, grew up in Argentina and then came back to England, attended Harrow, which is one of the very top private schools, uh, attended Cambridge University, but dropped out. And he was making motorcycles by the time he was around 19 years old. And they were the fastest, they were the most glamorous. They were, you know, something very special. But by the end of his life, he was really living in poverty in mm. public housing. Um, and my father knew Vincent. I'm not sure if I met him. I certainly met Phil Irving, his Australian co-designer. So I knew there was a really interesting story. And we, we began to look into it. We spoke to the family. Um, I knew Vincent had recorded a lot of his travels on uh, a very high-end Bolex camera. So the project shifted a gear when we got his films restored and digitized. And I mean, this is probably five or six years ago by now, we've been working on it. Um, and then our American producer, James Salter, uh, we raised some finance, we went to California to film. Uh, we filmed Jay Leno in his garage. He's a big Vincent fan. He's got one of every model. Uh, we got the last interview with John Surtees, who was an apprentice at Vincent's and is and remains the only man to win the world championship on two and four wheels. Um, so, we, you know, we knew we had a good film. Um, it takes a while, especially doing it, you know, both Jerry and I were working full time and uh, having other commitments. Mm. And then about a year and a half ago, we met another Vincent owner. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> Vincent ownership's like a Masonic lodge. I think there's um there's almost a secret handshake. Um, a lovely chap called Russell Light, who is a film editor and you know one of the best in in London. Uh, and we began putting it together seriously. By then, I'd reached out to Ewan McGregor during lockdown, and we recorded his voiceover from my script. Um, and Ewan was wonderful. I think he was. Uh, keen to keep working during lockdown you know he's one of those professionals i think just wants to keep going to the next project 
Uh, and so that obviously brought a lot to the table, mm. partly, you know, I'll be honest, you and profile, but also his voice. His voice is just like a, it's a musical instrument. Mm. And he knows motorcycling because obviously he's done several of the long way series with Charlie, Charlie Borman. So he knows the history of motorcycles. I don't think he knew a great deal about Vincent, but that was probably good. He was on a he was on a journey of discovery as well. Mm. And that's really brought us to where we are now. And it's playing at the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival, which is which is great. Well, congratulations on that. Quite, what a process! And uh, and uh, I, as I said, I was really quite fascinated. Uh, and and what particularly intrigued me is that you found some fantastic archival footage, home movies, photos, and even some nitrate film. I notice uh, that's dotted yeah. throughout, the, which uh, is you know quite problematic. But uh, but you've included all that. So tell me about discovering all of that and putting it into the film. Yes, well, this was through the Vincent family. Uh, his daughter, Dee, who's uh, been a great supporter of the film, and her son, Phil, and also uh, Philip's father, Robin, who's sadly passed away. But they, they've been absolutely brilliant. It's obviously very close to them, particularly Dee. This is her father the film is about. Um, so we, I knew they had some films, and some of them been, have been seen in a a very good video of quite a few years ago called Chasing Shadows. Uh, but that was very focused on the sort of nuts and bolts of the motorcycles. And we always, from the trust, wanted to make a, a human story. And some of the films were literally in a garage. Yeah. And we were probably making a, a nuisance of ourselves, going, you know, bringing them down from Sheffield and, you know, we can get them digitized and get them restored and log the contents. Uh, and over a couple of months, you know, one film would appear, one canister would appear. Um, you know, one or two of them were too degraded to use, but we were so lucky that most were still in reasonable condition and, and Jerry supervised the restoration. But as you say, it brings, it really brings the whole story alive. I, I think without the archive, we would have, you know, I think a good documentary, but this is Vincent's life as he lived it through the lens of his own camera, um, his long-term girlfriend is featured a lot, and then his wife, and Dee makes an appearance as a young baby. So it, it gets you closer to, to the man, I believe it does. Oh, it certainly does. It it uh, was such a well-rounded uh documentary as I said I knew nothing about him but I learned a great deal I, I was interested to see the number of people that you're able to interview apart from family members and so on everyone who or people associated with him and that you shot those in black and white I found that very interesting yes it was um I think like like many decisions part part technical and part artistic if not artistic creative um because a lot of the archive film was in colour, and obviously everything we shot was in colour, um, myself, uh, Steve Reed was our director of photography, um, and Jerry, we we had this we had this idea that Vincent's films, where possible, would be in colour. The B roll, the action of the motorcycles, the contemporary action would be in colour, but the interviews would be in black and white because we were. A lot of the interviews were talking about the 1940s and 50s. Mm. Um, so there was that element. And then, you know, with a, a sort of director's eye, I have to say people who were in their 80s, uh, one or two people were in their 90s, uh, they just look better in black and white. You know, you, you, you see the character of the face rather than the blemishes. You know, I put it that way. Mm. So it's interesting you noticed it. And I, I, I'm really glad the way it's turned out. Um, so there is there is some kind of logic to it in and a reasonable amount of consistency throughout yep uh, it works well for me i i like that uh, stylistic uh, choice and uh, mm. uh yeah very interesting and and i mean he had such an interesting life uh in terms of um uh, designing motorcycles when that was not something that was usual for someone like him or at his age and all that sort of yeah. thing and uh, 
and of the people that he worked with, and you've mentioned Phil Irving, uh, who's Australian, but also there's another Australian mentioned, Jack Errett. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, he worked with so many uh, interesting people in in making these motorcycles that were quite incredible by the sounds of it. Yes. Uh, Jack Errett was somebody I didn't know much about. I sort of, as I say, been around Vincent's. Um, knew the name uh peter bender who is now the owner of the jack error lightning uh has been a fantastic help in the film and he's, he's a wonderful custodian because he wants the bike to be used to be seen um you know him and his friends have, have ridden it quite a lot in tasmania where it lives um but jack error the more we found out the more interesting he was i mean he was called mad jack for the reason that he was just he was out there, um, and with Peter's help, we got the Jack Errett bike back to Gunnedah, where it set the Southern Hemisphere speed record. Uh, and in fact, it was the Southern Hemisphere speed record for two or four wheels at the time. Um, we managed to trace uh, a friend of Jack's, uh, this is mainly to Peter, but also a couple of elderly gentlemen who actually saw Jack go over 140 back in the early 50s. And so that was a, a lovely part of the film. We, we sort of recreated the records, obviously not at 140 miles an hour, but we were able to talk to a couple of gentlemen who watched them as young boys. And they they literally, you know, the word went round, there's a guy on the, on the road, he's gonna do a speed record. And they all kind of missed off school for the morning and went and watched, and then went back to school in the afternoon. <laughs> and that vibe that they watched, set the Southern Hemisphere record, is now the world's most expensive motorcycle. It sold at Bonhams for uh, 1.2 million Australian dollars, uh, which is interesting. That's about, you know, just over or around 40 years after Philip Vincent passed away in 1979, pretty much penniless. Just, you know, another 40 years later and, and his motorcycles have made the record books again, but because of value, not because of top speed. An amazing story, and the engineering that uh, obviously went into uh, those motorcycles, as well as um, the issues of uh, how some of those failed, and uh, uh, and so on, because it's it's such a, a tricky and and dicey sort of area to work in. Uh, but mm. he he seemed to uh, to master it pretty much. Yes, I think. As we say in the film, it, it wouldn't have happened without Phil Irving. Um, and one of the lines of the film is, this is when Lennon met his McCartney, when Phil Irving joined the firm in 1931. And Irving grew up in Western Australia. Um, more parallels than you might at first think between Phil Irving and Phil Vincent. They both grew up in the outback. So Irving in Australia, Vincent in Argentina. Uh, both their fathers, so Vincent's father was a vet, Irving's father was a doctor, were some of the first people to get a car. So they were seeing mechanical objects, you know, very early in the in the last century. Um, both were really bright, creative people, very driven. I mean, Irving didn't come over to the UK on a liner. He came on the back of a HRD motorcycle outfit overland, you know, and it, 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 it's his wonderful autobiography of few years ago he he passed away about i think maybe eight or nine probably more uh, years ago uh he describes coming over through canada on this little old motorcycle and they had they had pistols with them they had to shoot bears away um and he was that sort of character really determined but when he got together with vincent he brought this real down-to-earth practicality and um, Edith Irving, who's uh, Phil Irving's widow, is in the film extensively. As she says, you know, sometimes Phil Vincent's ideas would kind of go a little bit in, into the stars and Phil Irving could bring him back down to earth. So the, the practicality of Irving combined with the vision of Vincent and the money that Vincent's family financed the company, that's produced the media post-war motorcycle which is really the template the series b repeat um the more we looked into it the more we discovered that they'd obviously been working on this bike during the end of the second world war because the 
the model itself, 1000 CC, you know, revolutionary in as much as they dispense with the frame. So there's a there's an oil tank and there's the front forks and then there's the rear suspension, but they bolt on the engine. Um, 1000 CC, 110 miles an hour. And it, it came on sale in 1946. And then we, we looked into these audio recordings that uh, we found of Vincent through a, a lovely gentleman called Roy Harper, who was a friend of both Irving and Vincent. And, you know, he says there was nothing else to do during the war. There was nothing else to talk about. <laughs> so we talk about the motorcycle we build after the war. So I had this lovely, you know, perhaps slightly uh, creative vision of bombs falling in London, which is just 30 miles south of Stevenage, where they were built. And these two young men falling over a drawing board going, this is what we're going to do. As soon as those bombs stop, this is what the motorcycling world needs. Uh, and they did it. And it was, you know, absolutely way ahead of anything Norton or BSA or Triumph did. Most of them just sort of rebadged their pre-war models. And this Vincent came out, you know, V-twin, short push rods, uh, rear suspension, which is a real novelty. They weren't the very first to do it, but they, they never built a motorcycle without rear suspension. And that was very unusual. Um, so they... They work together, and I think there's a sort of symbiosis, you know, a kind of genius of where two people came together, hence the Lennon and McCartney reference, which I, I wrote in the script. Right. <laughs> How very, very interesting. And with Philip Vincent, it was great that you, and you've mentioned this, the um, audio recordings uh, in 1970 of uh, uh, of Phil Vincent, and uh, that, of course, adds so much because that gives us real uh, information about uh, what he was going through and doing at the time. Yeah, and you can hear his voice. Uh, mm. So young Phil, as we, we began to call his grandson, of course, he was born after his grandfather passed away, so he'd never heard his voice. And that was a sort of quite an emotional moment, as was when we, we got the rough cut and obviously showed it to Dee and Phil, daughter and grandson, and sat and watched it with Russell, our editor, and and that was an emotional moment because for Dee, she'd seen the films, she hadn't heard the audio recording, so she'd not heard her father speak for forty years, um, and they looked at it, and, and once the sort of credits rolled, you know, there's Russell and myself, and I think Jerry, rather nervously looking over to the family, and but they were wonderful. They said, "Goodness, you you brought this together, you told the story." Um, you know, there was more editing to do. Well, that sort of brought it home to me. But of course, you know, when you're in the edit, as you know, you, you're so focused, you know, should we say this there? If we, if we say it there, then the audience will know it, that, that it becomes a very interesting sort of intellectual challenge. And then it brought back the emotion to me, uh, which was wonderful. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad it, it kind of hit home, which I think it did with the family. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm certainly did, and uh, and you've mentioned Jay Leno. I mean, he's quite a natural. Uh, he's such a collector of uh, of cars mm -hmm. and motorcycles and so on. He's a a good go to person to uh, comment on all this. Yeah. yeah, he was wonderful. He um he gave us over a day of his time. It was a day's filming, but then we stored a motorcycle at his place, and his garage is you know I'm sure many people have seen it online. Um. I mean, A, it's breathtaking, the scale of the cars and the motorcycles. Mm. But I've, I've been in a few private collections. And I have to say what's lovely about Jay's is it's kind of like, you know, your friend's garage might be. There's a few people around. They're working on bikes. You know, there's there's no big, oh, don't touch that. Don't go in there. Oh, that's off limits. There's, there's no ropes to stop you walking up close to the Lamborghini. And everybody's working on a project. And it's a working garage, which is, I think, what Jay wanted from the first. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then we all had lunch. Pizzas were ordered and then we carried on filming. Remarkable. Um, and he has this incredible knowledge that you, you walk past the car and you go, oh, oh that's the uh, the little Honda 800. He goes, yeah, they're really interesting. This was a, a double overhead cam engine and it's 800 cc, you know, really kind of something new in the market. And it was tested by road and track and it did... Um, any any vehicle in there, he sort of goes through his own Rolodex and he can talk 
And, and of course, he's a natural performer, been doing stand up all his life. Mm. Um, he's a big star on late night talk show in America. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was another key part, I think, of the, the film's progression from Jeremy and I filming some elderly men and women who worked at a factory in the 50s. It, it really grew. Yes, yes. Tell me about the Black Shadow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Black Shadow is, um, as one of the contributors to the film, Paul Simonon, who used to be in the class, he's a, a motorcycle rider, um, which is how I got to know him years ago. I think he sums it up. Um, you know, he says, I think all motorcycles should be black. And it, but Vincent was a genius for coming up with names. So there were, all of them were called something like the Grey Flash. It's like this boy's own sort of narrative. Um, I mean, other motorcycle manufacturers had names, like the Triumph Bonneville is very famous. Um, but a lot of them, you know, the BSA had an A7 or an A10. And, and I think part of Vincent's appeal and actually part of his downfall later was that he sort of mapped into this Edwardian sense of adventure, which was the period he was born into. Um, so the Black Prince and the Black Knight. And, but by the sort of mid to late 50s, the market had moved on. Um, Triumph had introduced a model that was as fast as the repeat. But the, the Black Shadow remained, I think I'm right in saying, the, the, the fastest motorcycle that was sold until the early 70s. So it would do 125 miles an hour, or a good one would, which is, which is, which means the ones they lent to the, the magazines of the time. But really, until the Kawasaki Z1 came along, Z900, that was the fastest motorcycle on the road. Of course, the challenge by the late 60s was spares were getting quite difficult to come by. They are quite individual in terms of the engineering, the architecture. So they got this reputation as being not that safe, which I'm sure was due to poor spares, poor maintenance and being able to do easily over 100 miles an hour. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure a tired one in 1968 would, would be the ideal vehicle to do. But the, the Vincent Owners Club, which I, I grew up in with through my parents, um, it's a very strong club. There's a big Australian representation. You know, these, these people use the motorcycles all year round. They do really big distances and they're still working, you know, that's a tribute to, to Vincent and Irving. Uh -huh. Again, very, very interesting to hear all that. Okay, yes, I can see you're struggling a little. That's okay. We're, we're, um, I'll round it up in, in a minute. I, I wanted to ask you uh, about, and you've mentioned the editing process briefly, but um, uh, constructing the story, uh, putting all the footage, everything, the interviews, everything together, that is quite a challenge. And, uh, I mean, it's a, a pretty tight 78-minute uh, documentary, which I was quite impressed by. Yeah, I wanted, um, from the first, I, I didn't want the film to outstay its welcome. Mm. Uh, you know, we've all sat through films thinking, well, you know, I know where it's going now. So once you know where it's going, <clears throat> I think it's incumbent on you as the, the the people behind the film, the editor and the director, to actually get there. Um, so I, I always thought we could make this pretty tight. I mean, obviously, when I did the script, it was way longer than necessary but you didn't know what would work when you came to the edit mm. so you know, dear you and mcgregor read the script it took three three and a half hours we did it over um well he was in his house james saul to our american producer was in a sound studio in santa monica and i was on facetime talking to them both <laughs> uh but yes it was interesting i i worked in television on shorter items i used to be a director on top gear and i worked on some food programs it's so different you're absolutely right you know a, a four or five six is very condensed you're saying one or two things and you say them quickly whereas this was like writing a novel mm. you know where do you start <clears throat> where do you drop in bill irving's introduction into the story um and the key thing is the jeopardy because of course nobody nobody launches a motorcycle thinking it will fail. So when Vincent launched the last ones, the Black Prince and the Black Knight, the very controversial, fully enclosed, he was convinced that was the future. And 
<clears throat> many years later, he's been proved right, but it didn't go down well with motorcyclists. Motorcyclists are quite conservative. Equally, when they were doing the speed records, uh, Montlhery, which is this amazing bank circuit near Paris where we filmed, they took eight speed records and Vincent thought that would give them a shot in the arm. And it, and it did to a degree. <clears throat> but I think the, the challenge he had, and Phil Irving mentions this in his autobiography, was if you attach too much of the brand value to top speed, A, something will come along that's faster and then your brand is diminished. And B, you're perhaps missing out on a big part of the market that just wants a high-performance motorcycle. So I think there was a tension. Phil Irving left in, in, in 1949. I mean, the other key moment that's in the film, which again emerged with our research and the interviews, was Philip Vincent had this very bad accident on a, on a repeat in 1947. And, you know, he was more damaged than I think most people realised at the time. And, of course... <clears throat> You know, the factory workers didn't know much about it. Why would, you know, you communicate that the boss has had a bad accident? Mm. But he lost his sense of balance. He couldn't ride a motorcycle. And again, the more people we spoke to, especially John Surtees, he said he he had a personality change and he became much more standoffish. He became more short-tempered. Mm. So this is what we know today is, you know, post-traumatic symptoms. Mm. And he was in a coma. And the more we pieced it together and the more we spoke to people, the more I think it's a good part of the story or the, the narrative is that, you know, he wasn't the same person that he was in the 30s and mid 40s. Yeah. So there's, it's another, um, you know, quite sad element. And he never produced another vehicle. I mean, he worked on lots of designs right until his death. He was still, his D, D his daughter said very charmingly, he was, I think his last stay in hospital before he passed away, he was still trying to write and design things on bits of paper on the hospital bed. And he, he would say to T, take this, take this, take this to Professor so-and-so at uh, you know, Goldsmiths University or something. Hmm. And of course, the family would take these bits of paper and say, of course, of course, yeah, I'll take it right away. So he was still buzzing with ideas, even though the, the body was failing. Um, but it, it just never quite happened in the same way that it did with Vincent Motorcycles. And, and that that's very sad, really, because he clearly if harnessed or if his personality had been different, he would have been an asset to any automotive enterprise. Mm -hmm. And Phil Irving was all along, you know, Phil Irving went on to design the Repco Brabham. Um, so he is the only man to design a, let me get this right, a world speed record setting motorcycle and a Formula One winning car engine. Hmm. Rather like John says, he's, that's that's never going to happen again. But Irving could just go from one project to the other. It, it didn't phase him. He designed a tractor. <laughs> he designed a Formula One engine. He he just loved getting into a challenge of uh, designing something or improving it. Whereas Vincent was more obsessional. He had an idea for a rotary engine and pursued that to the nth degree rather than being as flexible as his former colleague. Uh -huh. Fascinating story, and you tell it so well in this documentary. Um, now, the film uh, Speed is Expensive is screening as part of the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival, of course, uh, in July. Uh, how else will the film be screened? Is it at other film festivals, for example? Uh, there's a couple we're waiting to hear from, and uh, we've got some conversations going with distribution agents in Australia. Ah. Uh, it's, it, you know very satisfying it's it's almost sold out at the first screening at melbourne uh so a second screening is being organized and you know that's given us a, a really good lift in the southern hemisphere and mm. we have <clears throat> uh arrangements for a screening in los angeles in the end of august uh a couple of european screenings um but you know from the first because we've been to australia filming because of the arab bike because of Phil Irving, we really wanted to get it out there in Australia. So if any of your viewers and listeners, if they go to our social media feed, which is either on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, uh, that's how we're kind of updating uh, the release plans.
So uh -huh. it's getting, I think we'll know more in a week or so. Oh, good, good to hear that. And just to um, uh, two very final questions. Um, how has the family and others who you interviewed reacted to your film? Uh, wonderfully. We, when we we had our our first screening at the Barnes Film Festival in London last year, on a sweltering evening, right by the River Thames, um, and they came along, and by then. Uh, Phil and Serena, young Phil, the, the grandson, they'd had a baby daughter. So she came along and she was only weeks old. So we had three generations of the family. We had Dee, we had Phil, and then Phil and Serena's daughter. And and it was a wonderful evening. And we did some interviews afterwards. And, and Dee is a you know, very intelligent woman who obviously was very close to her father. So she talked eloquently about, about the film about Vincent and uh, and then since then we've been in touch uh, hopefully Phil and Serena are coming over to Los Angeles when we when we have a premiere there at the end of August now it's been great I, I knew them quite well anyway but I obviously got to know them a lot better and Phil is in the film to quite a good degree he came to Jay Leno's with us um, and him and Jay you know going through lots of Vincent's sort of scrapbooks um, and we filmed in Australia, so it's good. Um, as well as anything, they've, they've, I wouldn't say they've left me to it, but they've had some input, but it's always been positive. Uh, and at no point have they said, oh, I'd rather you didn't cover this element. You know, they've, they've been really good about supporting, telling, you know, what we hope is quite a deep, quite a moving story. It certainly is. And uh, David, I must ask you, are you working on another film at the moment? I've started. I'm, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm doing another one. Uh, hopefully it won't take as long. It won't take nine years or so. Um, I, I won't say too much, but it, it's on a on a food writer, quite a famous food writer over here, a woman called Elizabeth David, who um, has this wonderful backstory. It's a similar period to the Vincent story. She published her first book in 1949 um, and changed the way the British looked at food. She introduced, I mean, obviously there was French chefs and so on, but she introduced it to a lot of people. But even before she wrote about food, she worked for British intelligence during the war. She'd eloped to France with a married man in 1939 by boat, um, got arrested in Italy. Uh, so that's what I'm, I'm working on. And I've done a couple of interviews and yeah, hopefully gonna do some more interviews over the coming months. Like, rather like with Vincent, I'm, I'm very keen to capture the people who knew and worked with her. Mm. And similarly, there's a demographic element where you want to do that as soon as you can. Yes, I understand. Sounds like a great story. Mm. And uh, another great story is Speed is Expensive, Philip Vincent and the Million Dollar Motorcycle. And uh, that's uh, that documentary is screening as part of the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival in July. And it's been my great pleasure to be speaking to the writer-director of Speed is Expensive, David Lancaster. David, thank you so much for talking with me. Pleasure's all mine. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Thanks again. Bye-bye.